This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at how billionaire Democratic presidential candidate Michael Bloomberg um, wields the power of his money in different ways, there was a major front-page story in Sunday's New York Times headlined, In Bloomberg, Liberals See a Wallet Too Big to Offend. The piece lays out how Bloomberg has kept potential critics quiet by making major donations to progressive caucus causes and advocacy groups around the country. The Times reports, quote, that chilling effect was apparent in 2015 to researchers at the Center for American Progress, a liberal policy group, when they turned in a report on anti-Muslim bias in the United States. Their draft included a chapter of more than 4,000 words about New York City police surveillance of Muslim communities. Mr. Bloomberg was mentioned by name eight times. Times in the chapter, which was reviewed by The Times. When the report was published a few weeks later, the chapter was gone. So was any mention of Mr. Bloomberg's name. Well, for more, we go to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by Yasmin Tayeb, one of the authors of the report. She says they were told to make major changes to the chapter or remove it. Other officials told The New York Times they revised the report to make it focus on right-wing groups targeting Muslims. When the report came out, Bloomberg had already given the Center for American Progress three grants worth nearly $1.5 million and contributed $400,000 more in 2017. Yasmin Tayyib no longer works at the Center for American Progress, but she is now a member of the Democratic National Committee. And still with us in Philadelphia, journalist Blake Zeff, who covered New York politics and Mayor Bloomberg's three terms. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much both for joining us. Um, Yasmin Tayeb, tell us what took place when you worked for the Center for American Progress. Tell us about this report. Sure. So, as you likely know, Amy, uh, Fearing 2.0, which was released actually exactly uh, five years ago today, and I was uh, on your show. Uh, five years ago, talking about the findings. It was a follow-up to Center for American Progress's uh, blockbuster Fearing uh, first report, which was released in 2011. And the re report was simply a follow-up to, you know, discuss uh, the tightly knit network of anti-Muslim activists, politicians, organizations, and, and funders who are, uh, you know, fanning anti-Muslim sentiment. And the report Additionally, was to chronicle and, and detail anti-Muslim policies that were being promoted. And in particular, this is racial and religious profiling by law enforcement across the country. And so, talk about your chapter on um, surveillance of the Muslim community during the Bloomberg administration by the NYPD police and bias against the Muslim community. What did you say there, and what happened to this chapter? Why didn't we see it? So, there was a very, you know, detailed chapter about the NYPD's demographics unit. So the demographics unit was established shortly after 9-11, and it was operating for more than 10 years or so. And the demographics unit was tasked with mapping the Muslim community in New York City, and that entailed, uh, you know, following, monitoring, surveilling Muslims of, of where they prayed, shopped, and ate. Uh, the program was later ruled unconstitutional. Mayor Bloomberg and his administration, throughout the, the in, entire, uh, you know, period, defended this program. This program, as you likely know, resulted, actually, in, in zero terror leads. This program was unconstitutional. It, it had a chilling effect on the local Muslim community there. And my colleagues and I, the co-authors, uh, which included Ken Good, Ken uh, Sofer, and Matt Duss and I, we simply detailed exactly what happened and, and purpose and, and impact of this discriminatory program. And, you know, while we were in the final stages of this report being released—and this is literally within a week of the program. Uh, the, the project being launched, uh, we had to get approval from senior officials at the Center for American Progress, and that's 
when the chapter was flagged by a member of the executive committee who actually previously had worked for Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. And he said that there would be a strong reaction uh, by Bloomberg World if this report was released uh, as it was. And so, you know, we went back and forth um, multiple times with the executive committee defending uh, you know, the, 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 the importance of the inclusion of this chapter. And unfortunately, the executive committee ultimately decided to remove it because, in, in my view and my colleagues' views, because of how it was going to be perceived by Mayor Bloomberg. Hmm. And so, talk about the significance of this. And I want to bring Blake Zeffen here to talk about the pattern here that you see. That was a report by the Center for American Progress. We didn't see that particular chapter. Um, in The New York Times, uh, the Center for American Progress responds and argue, says they are— um, uh, that they had um, focused on uh, that uh, they disputed the account, arguing there had been substantive reasons to revise or remove a section on police surveillance. Why did you, um, uh, Yasmin Tayeb, decide to remove it entirely rather than revise it? So, because it was so clear that they wanted us to produce uh, an, ac an inaccurate portrayal of the demographics unit's egregious actions. We absolutely did not want to whitewash what the NYPD did. And, I mean, again, this is a program that was later ruled unconstitutional. This is a program that infringed on the First Amendment rights of, of Muslims uh, in the local community. This is a program that, again, was disbanded by Mayor de Blasio because it let, it was a complete failure. Not only was it unconstitutional, a complete failure and led to zero terror, uh, you know, leads. It, for, for me, it was incredibly frustrating. It was incredibly disconcerting because of the amount of work that we had put into this to this uh, report and project. This was an ongoing report that we had worked for more than a year. And within, you know, days of launching the project and the interactive, being told by senior officials, unfortunately, at the Center for American Progress uh, to remove it. Hmm. Blake Zeff, the issue of the pattern and practice here. Yeah, look, if you um, see that, that New York Times article that you were referring to, Amy, there's a really interesting quote in there where former DNC chair Terry McAuliffe, who um, was really one of the most prodigious fundraisers for the Democratic Party over the last couple of decades, uh, you know, first for the Clintons, then for uh, the Democratic Party, and then later, for, you know, for his own races, he basically says that Michael Bloomberg was one of, if not the most important fundraisers for the Democratic Party during that time. And as a result of that, I mean, he really has been Bloomberg a towering, a prodigious, a towering figure in Democratic circles because of his uh, pocketbook and the fact that he has been bankrolling a lot of these groups, a lot of these causes. And as a result, that enables him to wield a tremendous amount of influence. Um, I wanted to go to the beginning of this blockbuster New York Times piece. Starts on the front page, goes to two other pages. This is the opening paragraphs. Um, the New York Times writes, In the fall of 2018, Emily's List had a dilemma, with congressional elections approaching and the Supreme Court confirmation battle over Judge Brett Kavanaugh underway. The Democratic Women's Group was hosting a major fundraising luncheon in New York. Among the scheduled headline speakers was Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor, who had donated nearly $6 million to Emily's List over the years. Years. Days before the event, Bloomberg made blunt comments in an interview with The New York Times expressing skepticism at the, about the Me Too movement and questioning sexual misconduct allegations against Charlie Rose, the disgraced news anchor. Senior Emily's List officials seriously debated withdrawing Bloomberg's invitation, according to three people familiar with the deliberations who spoke on the condition of anonymity. In the end, the group concluded it could not risk alienating Mr. Bloomberg, and when he addressed the luncheon on September 24th, before for an audience dotted with women clad in black to show solidarity with Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who accused Judge Kavanaugh of sexual assault, Mr. Bloomberg demonstrated why. 
He said, I will be putting more money into supporting women candidates this cycle than any individual ever has before, he declared. It was not an idle pledge. Bloomberg spent more than $100 million helping Democrats take control of the House of Representatives in the midterm elections. Of the 21 newly elected lawmakers he supported with his personal super PAC, all but six were women. Uh, Blake Zeff. Yeah, this is, I mean, that's a perfect example of this larger pattern and trend that we've been talking about. Um, also in the story, you know, just to come back to this Terry McAuliffe quote that I just mentioned, what's interesting about that is when Bloomberg first ran in 2001 and McAuliffe was the head of the DNC, he railed against anyone who had been part of the Democratic Party but was helping Bloomberg, whether that was consultants, endorsers, and, and groups, and, and whatnot. And then it shows that 20 years later, McAuliffe's talking about him almost with a sparkle in his eyes about what a great donor he's been and how important he's been and how he helped uh, fund some gun control uh, work that he had done. And, and this is something that you see, as you just mentioned with Emily's list, you see with McAuliffe, you see with all these groups who are faced these big dilemmas, just like the mayors I was mentioning before, just like the members of Congress that I was mentioning before, the charities, the nonprofits, all these groups that we've just been talking about all face the same dilemma, where they're either underfunded or they need money for a good cause. Bloomberg comes in and offers it to them, but then, as a result, they're put in this position where it's very, very difficult to criticize him. In many cases, they're being told that they need to support him. That's a really, really difficult and, and frankly, unprecedented situation in American democracy. Several prominent African-American lawmakers have endorsed Bloomberg in recent weeks. This is New York Democratic Congress member Gregory Meeks on MSNBC. Look, is I'm this? from New York. Michael Bloomberg ran three times. I didn't support him three times, primarily because of stop and frisk. Uh, it was a bad policy. Uh, at the same time, I also understand that Michael Bloomberg wanted to get guns out of the community so that innocent people did not get killed. African-American voters are always—they're very sophisticated voters. You know, they vote their interests. They know that their interest is making sure that Donald Trump is defeated. Uh, that's absolutely their interest. And so they're going to move in the direction that they think, who is the best person to defeat Donald Trump, and then who's also going to talk about their agenda. Now, um, M M Mayor Bloomberg has also formed Mike for Black America. Meanwhile, New York Times columnist Charles Blow wrote a new opinion piece, quote, let me plant the stake now. No black person or Hispanic person or ally of people of color should ever even consider voting for Michael Bloomberg in the primary. His expansion of the notoriously racist stop and frisk program in New York, which swept up millions of innocent New Yorkers, primarily young black and Hispanic men, is a complete and non-negotiable deal killer. Uh, uh, Blake Zeff, the what has just happened in these last few weeks? Yeah, there's been a, a bit of a rewriting of the stop and frisk legacy by Michael Bloomberg and some of his supporters. I mean, what we've seen Bloomberg do lately is say, look, I inherited this policy. I apologize for its excesses and I reduced it 95 percent. In fact, uh, let's go through each of one of those claims, one by one. Yes, the, the policy did exist initially under Republican Mayor Rudy Giuliani, and we all know who that is. But a new mayor can come in and decide whether they want to continue that or not. Not only did Bloomberg continue it, but he expanded it to record levels. When he first came in, the number of stops per year was under 100,000. Uh, it then rose steadily under Bloomberg to until 2011, when it reached its apex, and almost 700,000 stops were made that year. Uh, so. I say he inherited it, it factually is true, but he also greatly, greatly expanded it. In terms of uh, reducing it 95 percent, well, as I just mentioned, it just kept expanding until eventually in 2013, it does get rolled back considerably, but that's the year that a federal judge rules the policy unconstitutional. And Bloomberg was the subject of a uh, of, of, of a lawsuit, a, um, a class action lawsuit, and so that clearly had something to do with that. And in terms of the apology, this is really egregious because there were so many groups that were up in arms about this policy for many, many years, and Bloomberg and his uh, defenders remained defiant, constantly saying that we need this in order for crime to go down, and sort of suggesting that if you opposed it, that you were basically uh, opening the doors to the bad old days of crime, terrible crime coming back. Well, after the the policy was really, really curtailed after Bloomberg left. New York continued to see uh, these, these 
reductions in crime, and he was really proven wrong on that. Again, did not apologize. Years go by. Uh, the Daily News, one of his big editorial supporters uh, in general and also on Stop and Frisk, issued a big apology a couple of years after Bloomberg left, saying, we were wrong on Stop and Frisk. Bloomberg did not do that. Then let's go to 2019, January 2019. He's at a big event uh, for the U.S. Naval Academy. He continues to defend the policy. Finally, in November of 2019, he talks to an audience in Brooklyn and says, it was a black audience, and he says, I'm sorry, I was actually wrong about that. Seven days later, he declares his uh, candidacy for president of the United States. And, of course, he had said a year before, if he did run for president on the Democratic ticket, he would have to do a long apology tour. Um, Yasmin Tayeb, I wanted to go back to you. You're no longer with the Center for American Progress, but you are on the Democratic National Committee. You recently received a phone call from Mike Bloomberg. Can you tell us what that was about? Sure. So this was uh, at the end of December of, of 2019. This was, I think, just shortly after he launched his presidential campaign. And he said he was calling as a courtesy uh, to sit down with me, to introduce himself, to tell me why he's running, uh, why he's, uh, you know, able to, to win, and what he's done for the Democratic Party. I uh, did not <laughs> call him back. I simply because I, I wanted to kind of avoid an uncomfortable conversation where I assumed he wanted to ask me to support him. As you noted, I'm a DNC, an elected DNC member, which means uh, during a brokered convention on a second ballot, I will have a vote uh, for uh, you know to decide our next nominee. And I identify as a progressive activist, and I hope that whoever our nominee is is able to uh, excite the grassroots and increase voter turnout and fight for a progressive platform. So <clears throat> why wouldn't you want to talk to Michael Bloomberg? Uh, I mean, if if they reach out to me now, i'm I'm happy to to offer him the courtesy and sit down with him. I at the time, honestly, because of what happened at CAP, because of the policies he supported, because of the way he kind of entered the race and is now essentially <laughs> bankrolling uh, his campaign and, and buying an election, I, I felt very uncomfortable. And, uh, you know, if, if, if he or a member of his team reached out to me now, I'm, I'm happy to kind of offer them that courtesy and sit down with them. But at the time, I just— I didn't feel comfortable now, doing that. Now, let's talk about what could happen in the future, this whole idea of a brokered convention, and then the role you would play, Yasmin Tayeb, as a member of the DNC. Explain what this would look like. Sure. So, uh, as, as, as you may know, we passed reforms in the DNC that uh, eliminated the vote of superdelegates on the first ballot. So, at the time when we passed these reforms, and these were the most progressive reforms the DNC ha had passed, uh, from my understanding, and, and the grassroots was incredibly excited. These were reforms that I advocated for and, and lobbied for all across uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, talking to Democrats and telling them why these are these reforms are needed. At the time, unfortunately, when they passed, we were incredibly ecstatic, thinking that now the, the process in 2020 will become more fair and, you know, impartial, and the grassroots would be more, you know, kind of excited about this and, and less inclined to attack uh, the DNC and, and, and kind of leaders in the party. Unfortunately, because of how I do believe this nomination fight is going to move forward, I believe we're still on, we're still going to have at least four to five candidates uh, that are viable heading into the convention. I don't believe we'll have a single candidate uh, that's able to receive a majority of delegates. So, in order to avoid heading into a second ballot, we need to have at least one candidate that has at least I, I believe the number is about 1990 delegates. And I honestly I don't think that's going to happen. And this is particularly important and, and why candidates like Mayor Bloomberg are, you know, doing their homework. I mean, the fact that he reached out to me 
This is in the very initial part, uh, the first couple weeks that he entered the race, uh, shows that he knows it will likely be a brokered convention, and he's probably been reaching out to DNC members, uh, trying to, um, you know, ensure that he has as many supporters and, uh, on the DNC Blake as Zeff, possible. Blake this issue of superdelegates weighing in on the second vote, what do you foresee here and the significance of this? Sure. So, Let me put that question if, to Blake. Uh, Oh, well, I was going to say, I think this really speaks to another key point about Bloomberg um, that's worth getting into, because if it was just that he had billions of dollars and a ton of money, you know, Tom Steyer has a lot of money. Howard Schultz had a lot of money, right? That alone is not really the entire story here. It's For me, it's the, the story about Bloomberg and what makes his candidacy uh, potentially very potent is that it's a combination of endless resources, but also an extremely smart team that he has. They're very canny and clever, and also what I would call their Machiavellian approach to winning. And the fact that they're calling all these members to try to see if they can get those get that support this early on really speaks to that. They are going to understand. Like, look, Mike Bloomberg made his fortune. He didn't inherit a fortune from like an oil family, right? It was from data, analytics, communications, media. He really understands these areas. And they are looking at the numbers, and they know what they need the, to do. And they are starting that this far out. Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Very quickly, Blake Zeff, the role of President Obama, he is in so many of these national ads that are um, blanketing the networks across the country for Bloomberg, though he doesn't, uh, you know, specifically endorse him. Clearly, it seems like Bloomberg must have said, can I use you talking about me in these ads? What do you think Obama's role is here? I'm not so sure that they got permission. Uh, you know, look, very quickly, the history between Bloomberg and Obama is not that they're some great friends at all. Uh, as everyone knows, Bloomberg was a Republican for a long time, endorsed George W. Bush in 2004 when Obama was giving his classic speech uh, for John Kerry that year for the Democrats. Then in 08, Bloomberg does not endorse Obama. In 2012, he endorses Obama at the very last second in an op-ed almost half-heartedly in which he criticizes Obama as being divisive and partisan and overly popular. Populist. So they work together on some issues like gun uh, safety reform, the environment, things like that. And I'm sure that Obama, like others that we've talked about, is uh, appreciative of the fact that Michael Bloomer gave a lot of money for democratic causes. But they were not best buds who have worked together on a, on a lot of things. So the, the, the ad gives a little bit of a misleading impression. And I'm not so sure that um, Obama uh, is secretly behind the scenes pulling for Bloomberg and gave him permission to do that. Finally, I wanted to go to a clip of seeing uh, Michael Bloomberg at the U.N. Climate Summit in Madrid. Um, we caught up with him after well, what we thought he was holding a news conference at the U.S. Climate Action Center, which he funds, where uh, journalists would go to ask uh, politicians questions. He even shocked the people who worked at this um, uh, We're Still In uh, conference room, when he, after speaking, wrapping up his comments, after he called all the press and their pictures of, you know, him standing at the U.S. Cli the U.N. Climate Summit sign, he was surrounded by uh, his officials and security and walked out. So I tried to follow him to get my question to him. Mayor Bloomberg, will you be taking questions from the press? If you could just answer a question. We, we all packed in there to ask yeah, you you're questions. Gonna, you're gonna trip. But the U.N. has said that economic and climate inequality is driving protests around the world. Thank you, sir. You're a billionaire running for Thank president. You, You've spent more, tens of millions more dollars than the other presidential candidates. Will that be your strategy to win to, the presidency? We're here, to, we're here to talk about climate this week. Uh, that was his uh, campaign manager saying, we're going to uh, talk—we're only talking about climate. Of course, that night, he had a long interview um, with Chris John poor and he was talking all about the election. Uh, but calling a news conference and then walking out before the journalists got to ask the question, but having that photo op of hundreds of journalists around him. Uh, Blake Zeff, your last 20 seconds. 
Look, that's just another, another example of their strategy, which is to try to control every aspect of the campaign they can. And that's what the commercials enable him to do. If you run so many commercials and that's how you get your message out, you don't have to submit to interviews. You don't have to submit to scrutiny because you're already getting all the media coverage that you want. And that's a perfect example of their desire to really control every single aspect of this. And the money enables them, in large part, to do that. Blake Zeff, I want to thank you for being with us, journalist and documentary filmmaker, and Yasmin Tayeb, a civil rights lawyer, elected member of the Democratic National Committee. When we come back, we talk about Yemen, where 31 people were killed in U.S.-backed Saudi UAE airstrikes this weekend, including women and children. The U.N. called it shocking. Stay with us.